Hi guys, uh, let's move on to find out what Klian Brooks specifically points out uh, about the formalist critics. So as a new critic or, or someone who follows uh, the formalist uh, style of criticism, uh, in his work The Formalist Critics, Klian Brooks starts off with uh, 10 different articles of faith. And among the 10 different articles of faith, the first one is that uh, he points out that literary criticism is exactly a description and evaluation of the object, not just uh, not anything, nothing of kind about uh, the author, nothing of kind about uh, his background, his emotions, nothing like that. But it is the description and evaluation of the object, the literary work, the content which is uh, uh, fulfilled there. So. The, the structure, the form of the work, nothing related to uh, the, the author. So that's the first article of faith. And the second one, he says that uh, the new critic or the formalist critic, they uh, actually, uh, the primary focus or the primary concern of uh, the criticism, new criticism, uh, is to find out the problem of unity within uh, the textbook, within the literary text problem of unity in them is that you know it is kind of you know to find out the relations between the form content and the structure or the meaning within uh, the work so the kind of wholeness in order to find the wholeness the fullness of a work uh, uh, the, uh, the the structure or the meaning of the form uh, of uh, of a literary work is been analyzed or evaluated or appreciated by uh, literary critic. The third one is that you know uh, the, the formal relations in a, in, a, in, a, in a work of literature um, uh, may include, as for Klein uh, Brooks, uh, beyond logic. The formal relations in a work of literature, in the sense that you know it's not just what the author meant. It depends upon the reader to find out what exactly is uh, being pointed out there. So uh, it's beyond the logic. So what you can find beyond the logic from a literary text, that is of uh, prime importance for a literary critic, especially uh, a new critic. And, and next, uh, the fourth one in the Articles of Faith, is that in a successful work, in a successful work, form and content cannot be separated. Form and content. So they are concerning about form and content only. So in a successful work, you cannot leave aside form and content of that particular work. And the next one he's saying that form is nothing but meaning. Form is nothing but meaning, the inner depth of uh, each and every lines which is being this depicted in the literary text is being analyzed. It's, it's been uh, um, um, atomized and evaluated by uh, the literary critic. Okay, so the next one, the sixth one, is literature is ultimately metaphorical and symbolic. It is not real as per uh, the uh, Klein Brooks or the, the formalist uh, viewpoint. So that literature is ultimately metaphorical and symbolic. Nothing of a kind of you know, personal or nothing of a kind of intuitions or you know, aspirations, uh, emotions that have come out from uh, uh, the author's mind. Nothing of that kind as per um, new critics, as per Liam Brooks, he said that we are concerned only about uh, you know the metaphoric and symbolic aspects of uh, literary work. And the uh, seventh one, he's saying that the general and the universal literature can be struck by abstraction, but it is concrete that the general and universal are not seized upon by abstraction. There is no kind of abstraction there. So 
but got at through the concrete and the particular. So we need to find out the concreteness that uh, the base in which it has been created, so that the, the general and the universal thoughts are not abstract or that cannot be seized by uh, 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 abstractness of, of work. Instead, you need to find the concreteness which is on which it is being built. And the next one is that the uh, formalist critics or, or Clay and Brooks is saying that in the Articles of Faith, he's saying that literature is not a surrogate of religion. Literature cannot carry forward, uh, you know, religion in that sense. That doesn't mean that religious texts are included here. But on the other hand, you cannot consider a good text or uh, what you can call uh, the, the successful work cannot carry religious, uh, you know, aspects. It is not a surrogate of religion. Literature is not a surrogate of religion. And the next one, he says that, as he points out, or he's bringing in Alan Tate, he quotes Alan Tate uh, by saying that there are certain specific moral problems, and those moral problems are the subject matter of literature. And that, uh, but that the purpose of literature is not to point a moral. There are specific subject matters of literature. You can find subject matters of literature, but the, the point of focus or the purpose of literature is not just to point out morals. <laughs> it should not uh, be uh, focusing on morals alone. But there are morals. You can find morals within the text. But that is not the, the primary concern, or that is not the purpose of literature, as per Cleon Brooks. And the last one, he says, is that the principles of criticism, he's saying that the principles of criticism, and which uh, defines the areas of literary criticism, not framing methods to criticize. The principles of criticism define the area relevant to uh, you know, literary criticism. They do not constitute a method for carrying out the uh, criticism. So the principles of criticism, uh, the the amount of the, 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 the structure of criticism, what we believe as critics, that defines the area, the specific area that is relevant to literary criticism. And they do not constitute a method for carrying out criticism. So we are not, uh, you know, focusing uh, on a literary work on the basis of the principles of criticism but it all depends upon what we view you know how we view how we view the structure the form the content of a literary work he's saying that um, as a formalist critic as a russian formalist or a new critic we know that or the formalist critics they know that, you know, as anyone knows that uh, poems and plays uh, are, and even novels are written by men, that uh, they do not somehow happen or of a sudden it happened. No, it's not like that. We understand that. And that they are written as expressions of uh, particular personalities and are, you know, written from all sorts of motives as well. So we understand that it's been created uh, on the basis of of expressions and uh, uh, attitudes and at attributions are there and uh, additionally we understand that uh, it has certain motives as well which includes money from the uh, from money as well from a desire to express oneself uh, on one hand for the sake of uh, a particular course of something in history uh, something related to his biography uh, we understand everything like that you know Glenn Brooks uh, further moves on by saying that there are a few misunderstandings and objections uh, in which uh, literary criticism is being calibrated over the years. And uh, Normal readers, they think that literary criticism is kind of uh, cutting the literary text from its author, from uh, the aspirations, from the intuitions, from the emotions, from the rela relations uh, in which uh, the author uh, has been using over the years and his thinking, his, think, his uh, thought process, uh, it, it's been developed into the literary text. 
So that is absolutely wrong. We are not just concerned about, not just concerned about uh, these kind of, uh, you know, the, the emotions and attitudes or the attributions and intuitions of the other. We are looking uh, forward, uh, or we are looking much beyond the uh, the, the the attitudes or the the, the fear, uh, the kind of manliness, the kind of the kind of uh, uh, other otherhoodness in uh, in a literary work. So, what we are actually concerned is about the form, the content, and meaning, the real structure of uh, literary text, rather than uh, the relations or the emotions of uh, the order. Uh, and in some cases also, as uh, Pierre Brooks points out, that uh, like uh, in a university classroom, that uh, the professors uh, or some the, the person who teaches a literary text uh, normally looks uh, at the, uh, you know, uh, the, the personal, uh, the formalia of, of, of uh, the order, uh, his diaries, his letters, his conversations, his, uh, you know, uh, personal recordings or his you know involvements in his community and in his uh, uh, in his field uh, in order to write a particular work but uh, it is much beyond that you should have to uh, concern about uh, more things as per uh, Liam Brooks that's the the first kind of misunderstanding so it is the misunderstanding basically is uh, people think that literary text has to uh, come out from the other. That is absolutely wrong. That should be there in one part. But additionally, or the major share of uh, literary criticism is actually to find the real, uh, and to, to find the form, the content, and the structure, or the meaning in general uh, by the literary critic. Apart from that, uh, we do understand, we, in the sense that uh, we, the formalist critics or the new critics or Russian formalists, we do understand and we do accept the fact that, you know, uh, a literary work uh, is completely or merely potential until they are being read by the readers, uh, read by the, the different kinds of readers. But he's saying that, Glenn Books is saying that we have different types of readers uh, because uh, this in the sense that the you know, readers have their own thought process, they have their, their own thinking, uh, the way of thinking is there, they have their own way of understanding or interpreting a text uh, in the sense that, you know, you will, you will have, they are really multifaceted. And in that particular sense, uh, it, is, it, is, it is clear, it is evident that uh, empirical as well, that uh, reader is the final, uh, uh, the final word of understanding a textbook. But on the other hand, he uh, continues by saying that as critics, as especially as new critics, we are not at all interested in uh, understanding what the reader uh, thinks of a particular text, but we are concerned about nothing but the form and structure and meaning of a work, the, the, the content of a, a work, not uh, the, uh, the 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 biographical attitude or the biographical aspects and the psychological uh, attitude of, uh, uh, of of the author. When it is done, when the when the writer writes a, a particular work that is completed, and it is up to the uh, uh, the reader to decide. That is, uh, reader to interpret or reader to decide. That's up to a different theory. But for us. For critics, it is entirely different. We are concerned about the, the form, the context, and the structure, or the meaning of, of the text only. So um, he um, wants to criticize the work itself, uh, criticize the work itself, not uh, the biography, not the psychological aspects as well. So on the basis of this, uh, he further moves on to say that you know uh, the 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 intention, the the actual intention behind. Uh, writing a particular work, uh, we are not, uh, you know, encouraged or we are not uh, enthused to find out the actual intention behind uh, that partic any particular work. Instead, uh, what are the intentions that can be connected at the moment with the literary text on, on the basis of the current scenario, on the basis of the present uh, situation, 
how can we connect it with uh, the current situation and things like that will be there when it comes to the new critics uh, avoiding or leaving aside uh, the real facts or the real intention behind the uh, the writing of a particular uh, work by an author that is one assumption as per Clayton Brooks and uh, there is another thing that he would like to say as an assumption uh, from the part of a formalist critic uh, is that uh, the formalist critic assumes an ideal reader uh, that is instead of the, an ideal reader uh, concern is only concerned about uh, you know uh, the, the 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 aspects which are uh, called the structure the aspects which are called the the, the form or the content or the meaning of a work so the formalist critic assumes an ideal reader that is instead of focusing on the varying spectrum of possible readings he attempts to find a central point of reference from which he can focus upon the structure of the poem or novel. So with a central uh, point of reference of understanding a particular work, he, from that particular focal point, what as formalist critics do is that you know, they, will, uh, they can focus upon the structure of the poem or novel. So that is the uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, criticize criticism or uh, crit critical attitude or critical appreciation by uh, the, the, the Indian critics as per uh, Clayton Brooks. Well, uh, moving uh, further, uh, Clayton Brooks uh, uh, gives us some kind of uh, uh, you know understanding about how to become an ideal reader or what exactly uh, an ideal reader uh, means. So there is no ideal reader as per him. There is no ideal reader. Uh, someone is prompt to point out and he will probably add that it's sheer arrogance that allows the critic with his own blind sides and prejudices to put himself uh, in the position of that ideal reader. Sometimes the critic says that you know, we are the ideal reader. On the other hand side, we can find that there are several other re readers as well. So uh, comparing the reading of a critic, uh, he's actually compare, he's trying to compare reading from the point of view from a critical point of view and uh, from a genuine readers point of view so he's actually dividing uh, readers into two one a genuine reader someone who would like to uh, get some kind of you know attain some kind of enjoyment or entertainment or some kind of uh, uh, you know and uh, some kind of attainment uh, after reading a work on the other hand side, uh, a critical reader or a critic in general, specifically a critic, uh, he's not concerned about the entertainment, he's con not concerned about the enjoyment he's uh, getting after reading it, but instead he concerns about, he is only concerned about uh, the, the structure, uh, the, the content and the form or the meaning of, of that particular work. That is uh, the two different kinds of reader. The, so the, the gap between the two. It, the gap between the two, you can find it from the reactions that they get from uh, uh, the, the literary work. Uh, literary criticism moves to uh, socio-psychology. Literary criticism, it moves to socio-psychology. So based on these distinctions, the formalist rejects two popular, uh, exactly two popular uh, you know, uh, tests for literary uh, value. The f first proves uh, the value of the work from the author's sincerity, from the author's sincere, author's intentions, uh, putting his heart and soul in the work. That is the first one. With this attitude, with this uh, new critic attitude, uh, we do have to understand that we need to reject these two assumptions, these two uh, you know, uh, kind of tests. The first one is author's intentions. Uh, that means the author uh, it's trying to put his uh, intentions, that put his heart and soul uh, into the work. We not at all care about all these things. And the second one is um, is with with the with, with an example or with uh, yes with with an example from A. E. Hoosman. He's saying that yeah, bristling of his beard by A. E. Hoosman. So it is the kind of you know intensity of the reader's uh, reactions, the intensity of the reader's reaction. Uh, has critical significance. It has got critical significance only if uh, proportion, as we have already learned, to, to trust him as a reader. 
even so what it tells us is something about Hussman who is nothing decisive about the poem as well. So uh, it is actually uh, trying to, he's actually trying to, Cleon Brooks is actually trying to play down uh, the views denying humanity to either reader or writer. Uh, he, they are concerned, they are saying he's completely um, uh, rejecting the opinion, he's completely uh, calibrating uh, uh, the opinion that, you know, we are concerned only about uh, the, 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 the physical structure or the inner meaning and the, uh, the, mean, uh, the, the form and the content of the work only. We are not so concerned about uh, any kind of intentions, any kind of uh, psychological aspects or biographical a aspects of uh, a particular uh, work. Along with that, Cleon uh, Brooks is saying that uh, there is a general trend or there is a general kind of misunderstanding. The second part of misunderstanding or objection is that, you know, uh, is to emphasize the work seems to involve severing it from those who actually read it. So people think that, you know, oh, literary criticism means it is all about reader's interpretation. And it is all about uh, what the reader uh, comes out uh, from or his understandings on the basis of the literary text, which is his thoughts. It's not just that. You know, people think that or in the sense that when Wordsworth said uh, his poems are uh, man speaking to men, to multitudes, but it's not just that. It's not just that. It's, he says that Cleon Brooks is saying that you know the poem has its roots in history, in the past, and in the present. Its root in the past and in the present means you will have to find out, or you can find out, elements of or aspects of simple kinds of elements of poems and uh, prose work or novels that are being. Uh, created in the past which has definitely got some elements of history there and which will be concerned or which will be have a uh, kind of uh, concerns and uh, focuses in the present uh, scenario as well in the present uh, uh, situation as well as for uh, Cleon Brooks so the poem has its roots in history past or present it's place in the historical context cannot simply uh, be ignored. So you need to find the history behind or the aspect of history behind uh, the creation of a work as well uh, as Berkeley and Rose. Uh, that is also of primary concern when it comes to literary criticism. So two misunderstandings. The first one is actually people think that it is the, the prime aim or the primary focus of literary criticism is to cutting it off from uh, the author. That is absolutely wrong. On the second hand, it is the reader's uh, interpretation that has to be evaluated on the basis of literary criticism. That is also wrong because both these misunderstandings, both these elements are part of literary criticism. But it's, it is not just these things alone. It has much more than that. So literary criticism is much more than that. You need to find out the composition and the struggles to find a subject and the style uh, to get a hearing for himself or for the author, in fact. He, uh, Clear Brooks is not rejecting the fact that uh, there are instances in which uh, critics uh, also attain uh, certain kind of enjoyment or entertainment after reading a text and uh, in certain works, you know, they may be uh, pretty much intensely uh, moved. But uh, it has nothing or very little to do with, uh, you know, uh, the, the emotional state of mind of a critic. Is, uh, has, it has nothing to do with uh, criticism. It has nothing to do with uh, you know, uh, the subject or, or the, the substance or the meaning or the form of, uh, of a work. That is absolutely different from uh, the real point of view of a critic. Uh, because uh, as a critic, uh, it is his job, it is, it is his onus uh, uh, to find uh, or to uh, evaluate the text or criticize the text on the basis of the form and structure or the content of, of a literary it is not just 
uh, you know, understanding that text on the basis of uh, simple reading, uh, elementary reading, or fundamental reading, which is uh, which is uh, of, of uh, more of a, uh, a genuine kind of uh, reading, just for the sake of uh, know, understanding it, just for the sake of uh, getting some kind of you know relaxation for your uh, mental up upliftment and uh, things like that. Uh, uh, further moving on, uh, uh, Cleon Brooks is. Uh, uh, specifically uh, pointing out, he specifies uh, the the job of a critic. What exactly uh, are the different kinds of jobs uh, on the from the from the point of view of a critic? So basically, uh, critical uh, critic's job is rarely a purely critical one, uh, which involves uh, in trivial and uh, important tasks, as per Glenn Brooks. Call. So the formalist viewpoint, or the formalist point of view. Of understanding a critic is uh, purely critical one. They are saying that a critic's job is extremely important because it involves in trivial matters, futile matters, not unimportant matters, and at the same time, it includes uh, important matters as well, important tasks as well. He might be uh, a critic, might be. Uh, comparing two authors uh, or three authors or more than one author uh, while criticizing his judgment or while while, while uh, formulating his judgment that is uh, one option another one he may be uh, editing a text uh, for the purpose of uh, publishing it uh, editing a text uh, uh, in order to uh, interpret a particular literary text or he may be writing a, a newspaper review a brief newspaper review about a literary work that is also part of uh, the jobs, uh, part of the job of uh, a literary critic, and uh, we can find a literary critic uh, uh, presenting a paper in front of the Modern Language Association, or presenting the paper in front of uh, an invited audience, uh, in front of academics, and things like that will, will be there. You can find uh, from the from the part of a literary critic, and also you can find that um, at times you can find literary critic talking to their friend discussing about uh, you know anecdotes parables uh, you know uh, literary devices uh, symbolism imagery uh, on those kinds of literary devices uh, and especially sometimes he talks about talks too much and uh, garrulously speaks about uh, you know uh, a literary text its uh, its aspects its uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, reactions that they get after reading that he gets after reading uh, a particular text and things like that can be uh, are discussed by uh, a literary uh, critic. But uh, uh, that is the normal kind of critic. Uh, apart from this, uh, what uh, as a formalist critic or, or um, according to uh, Cleon Brooks, a formalist critic is uh, the real critic, is a genuine critic. And how to become a formalist critic? An ideal critic, uh, as per Cleon Brooks, should be modest. An, uh, an important role. He has an important role in his life uh, uh, to, to perform uh, because you know literature is not written on the basis of a formula. The viewer understand that literature is not written on the basis of a formula. It is not easy to uh, you know atomize. It is not easy to um, uh, structure and dissect and understand a, a, a literary text. It's all not the, uh, not the, not that much easy. Uh, a critic should uh, never conclude by saying uh, the success is not able to, uh, you know, conclude uh, by saying that this work is a successful work, this work is a great work, this work is a failure, uh, it is a flop. We are not, uh, as a new critic, as, an, as a formalist critic, it is not essential, it is not evident, or uh, we are not supposed to, you know, uh, give away uh, the, the the final result of of a text. Of, that is not our job. Uh, it's we are concerned about the, for, the 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 form and structure only. We are not concerned about whether this work has become uh, a great work, whether this work has turned out to be a successful work. We are not at all uh, our care of those things. Literature is not written on the basis of a formula. It is not work. It is not uh, written on the basis of a formula. It cannot be interpreted on the basis of a formula. So, we are not using a formula. But on the other hand side, we are using certain strategies. 
we are using certain devices we are trying to find a particular uh, point of focus in that within a text in order to understand from uh, the form from the structure from the content uh, from the meaning try to find the real meaning the knowledge of uh, the knowledge that a literary text can put forward uh, in front of uh, uh, the society in front of the community uh, so literary work uh, is a document literary work is a document which can be analyzed in terms of the forces that have produced it it can be analyzed as well it can be analyzed uh, uh, based on the intentions of the author based on uh, the emotions of the author uh, based on um, the forces behind it uh, to cre uh, during creation but uh, that uh, is kind of reducing literature to its uh, you know to its lower level uh, it uh, will not give you any kind of you know it will not constitute uh, something called criticism uh, be, uh, it if you if you try to analyze if you try to evaluate a text if you try to criticize a text on the basis of uh, uh, the, the intentions of the author on the basis of uh, 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 what created the text um, you are actually demeaning uh, the the text um, from uh, a critical point of view you're not criticizing it you're not uh, constituting criticism you won't get criticism you won't get real criticism from there uh, what uh, Clean Brooks uh, actually says is uh, you know you have to uh, evaluate text on the basis of uh, meaning or you need, or you need to find the real meaning the end result the ultimate result uh, should be uh, finding the real knowledge of uh, text uh, in order to do that he is bringing in uh, the examples of Lionel Trilling he's bringing an example from uh, Ezra Pound and uh, American writers O'Neill, Dos Passos, Wolf, William Faulkner is also uh, coming in for a while uh, what uh, his uh, Trilling has chosen to state the situation in terms of writer's activity but this judgment is plainly an inference from the quality of Faulkner's novels Trilling has not simply heard Faulkner say that he has had to struggle with his work so suppose uh, then that uh, we try to state uh, Mr. Trilling's point not in terms of the effort of the artist but in terms of the structure of the work itself so what Trilling is also he's bringing in Trilling as an example by uh, by uh, you know evidently pointing out to that uh, uh, Trilling is also or Lionel Trilling is also uh, you know, bringing in uh, the terms of structure of the work itself so the amount of uh, importance that has been given by Lionel Trilling for a structure of the work is also very important so uh, even though Lionel Trilling is not considered as a uh, new critic he is clear and book is bringing him uh, into the frame of uh, um, new critics or uh, formalist critic so it's also an important uh, development here a description in terms of tensions of symbolic uh, development of ironies and their resolution in short it's not the formalist critic uh, trying to describe in terms of the dynamic form of the work itself it, the formalist critic is actually trying to find the, the dynamic form of the work itself nothing else it's a liter as he mentioned before a literary work is a document and the document can be analyzed in terms of the forces that have produced it or it may be manipulated as a force in its own right it mirrors the past it may influence the future these facts it would be futile to deny and I know of no critic who does deny them that is uh, a, a quotation from uh, uh, Clean Brooks so what he's saying is good literature is more than effective rhetoric applied to true ideas even if you could agree upon philosophically artistic all right so um, towards the end of the work towards the end of the the formalist critics the article formalist critics Ian Brooks is saying that literature has many uses it has many uses critics proposes news new and spectacular spectacular and exciting uses out of the uh, many uses of literature be it uh, historical use be it uh, contextual use 
be it uh, the present use, be it comparing with the, uh, the present and the past and how he can uh, consolidate it uh, for a future. There are many uses for literature as well in books, but those uses are being developed, are being framed by a critic because critiques are the one who proposes the spectacular and exciting uses of literature. We are the one who uh, develop or uh, create or framing uh, the uses of literature as per Cleon Brooks. And these are all achieved by just one ultimate thing and that is to find the meaning of a text because knowledge is the basic because knowledge is the basic of understanding a text so that is how it should be done instead of uh, you know reading a textbook simply for understanding uh, the intentions of the author simply for understanding the emotions of the author or uh, just for the sake of understanding uh, uh, his time uh, period uh, during which he uh, wrote the work that is not uh, uh, that is kind of you know uh, demeaning or that's kind of uh, uh, you know, bringing in uh, uh, that particular textbook to a very lower level instead uh, what we as literary critic we as new critic or formalist critic as in the word itself you can find formalist so we are concerned about a uh, formal reform and content of uh, of a text only especially a poem of uh, poems and novels and uh, things like that and so uh, that's how leon brooks defines uh, the style of new critics understanding our uh, differentiation of the, the, the differences between uh, the critics and uh, readers genuine readers and how a critic reads a text or how a genuine reader reads a text what are the different kinds of reactions they get the gap between the reactions they get and uh, how to become uh, an ideal reader and uh, so uh, Cleon Brooks from a very staunch viewpoint very strong viewpoint of formalist critic he uh, amply pointed out that it is our duty to find the meaning of the text that is the real con concern uh, of a critic that should be the concern of the critic as per uh, Cleon Brooks. All right. So uh, thanks uh, for watching and thanks for your attention. Have a good day.